Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word, chapter 2, the great book of Genesis, uh, in the beginning. We have covered chapter 1, and don't forget, Father, in creating all things, putting this earth, which was void without form, back in proper shape, then, uh, then he... Um, did do one real special thing. He created male and female. This is where he created all the races and, and told them to fish and some to hunt. And don't forget that. It's very important. In verse 26 of chapter 1, he made fishers and hunters. That's it. Okay. To live off the land. And that being very important with uh, today's lecture as we pick it up and move forward uh, as he's recovering the earth from the destruction of the first earth age. Uh, God did not create this earth void and without form. It became that way at Satan's fall. And here he's making it inhabitable again. Chapter 2, verse 1, and it reads, uh, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. In the last verse of that last chapter, he said, and he looked and it was good. He loved all the peoples and as they were instructed to replenish the earth. Verse 2, and on the seventh day, God uh, ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. Verse 3, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. He didn't make it for himself, he made it for man, okay? Because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. And now for the higher critic and the higher critic only, I'm going to explain because they would disagree with what I'm about to say. I am well aware of the fact that we're going from P to J. It does not change the manuscripts. Verse four. These are the generations, or this is the history of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. That's from the beginning, from the very overthrow, as it was stated in verse 2 of that prior chapter, the history of it, and, um, and, and brings us on to the recovering or the regeneration into this earth age. Verse 5. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. Now, wait a minute. That should perk your mind up just a little bit. He told them to go fish on the sixth day, told them to go hunt. He didn't say anything about tilling the ground because he didn't create the Gentile races to till the ground. So he's going to create another man. When we go to past the ninth verse, I will explain this. The Hebrew manuscripts are very specific. And, but here, uh, you, know, it, you don't have to be a wizard to understand. 26, chapter 1, hunt and fish and replenish the earth. Chapter 2, verse 5, he still doesn't have a man to till the soil, so what is he going to do about it? Verse 6, but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. 7, and the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He became a living soul and man became a living soul. Now, many of you that are inexperienced with the word just simply translated man in English, you, if you have a companion Bible, your Appendix 14 will teach you a great deal 
about humankind, man, and it will teach you about the man, the special man, Eth Ha'adam is what his name is. We just covered it. Listen a moment, and then I'll go to the manuscripts and teach you directly from them. Verse 8, And the Lord God planted a, vine a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, the man, the special one. Okay, you got it? Uh, not that he, because he had a purpose, just like the other's purpose was to hunt and fish, he had a purpose to till the ground. Verse 9, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant in the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and so it is. Now, I want, to, I, I, I want to show you something here. I want you to go to um, a, 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 the manuscripts. I'm going to take you back to uh, chapter 1, verse 26. And here is the word man. The word in the Hebrew is Adam, the a leaf. And the, 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 the uh, dot at the bottom makes it A-D-A-M, Adam. There's no article and there's no particle connected with that. That is the man he created on the sixth day, which, which he created many of them, along with female. Don't forget that. Verse 26. Now, many of you, when, when you begin to study for yourself, you're going to find, well, the next time he mentions man in 26 and 7, it is eth ha'adam in the Hebrew tongue, and so it is. Why? Because God said, let us create man in our image. He included himself. And himself in man form is Jesus Christ. Therefore, the eth ha'adam through which Christ would come Naturally, that name then, when it is connected with God, is also Eth Ha'adam. Now, we just finished this uh, verse 9. Let's go, if we may, to, um, to the chapter 2 here on the screen. And here you see that the word man has increased in size tremendously. It goes from here to here. Hebrew reads from right to left. Here you have an elif, and the little three dots at the bottom of the A is E. And this letter is TH. So this is F. That's the article. And here you have H, A, that's HA. And then you have elif, A, D, A, M, Adam. F ha Adam. It's a totally different man. Under any, any way you want to cut it, any way you want to slice it, you have mankind, which are all the peoples of God's children. And then he realized, I, I want to make now somebody to till the soil, not to hunt, to fish, to be, um, to be a charisman of the land, a tender thereof, and so it is that um, he brought forth this Eth Ha'adam, not the same as Adam, humankind. Again, I want to remind you, if you want to educate yourself a little better on this, go to your 14th appendix in your companion Bible, and it will give you Ish, Eth, Enosh, um, and um, Adam, because you see the word translated man here is really in the Hebrew tongue, Adam, which means man. But when you put the article and the particle with it, it means the special man. It's emphatic. And it draws attention to this one man. And quite frankly, the entire story of our Father's Word or the history of it has to do with this man's family. Eth Ha'adam. It only use, it brings people into it when they come in contact with this man. This is why we have a work titled One Man's Destiny. It's this man. And th why? Well, because th through this one would come not this first Adam, but would come the second Adam, which is to say the Lord Jesus Christ. 
That is to say, God with us. So, you see, the manuscripts, when you pay attention to them, there is a difference. Only when you're reading the English uh, translation, you would never pick up on that. So it becomes very important that you know and understand. And of course, the manuscripts that we're reading from here are from the Greens in a Linear, which we carry in our library that gives you one of the least expensive total copies of the manuscripts, the best you can find, um, most accurate. I don't necessarily go 100% with Green's interpretation, but the manuscripts are perfect and are, are practically and just a wonderful work to deal with if you care to study to that depth. If you don't, no problem. But I wanted to at least teach you that much Hebrew, that the Aleph, the three dots, that's the letter E. And um, then the letter TH, D, F, and then HA, HA, and then ADAM, Adam, F, HA, Adam, a special man. And, and um, again, our Father has a plan of salvation. He had every intention of being, uh, coming here himself, a virgin conceiving and giving birth to the Lord Jesus Christ which being interpreted Emmanuel, God with us. So his plan doesn't change from the beginning. When we teach these, this book of Genesis, many will have never been taught chapter by chapter and verse by verse through this book. Really, in a way, if you don't understand the beginning of God's word, you're not going to understand the ending either. So it's important that you follow and understand. We've had the creation of all the races. You see, any genes geneticist knows that um, not all people could come from one couple with all the races we have in this world. Well, they're the way God created them, the way he wanted them. They're his children. They're made in the exact image they were from before. And he looked, and it was good, with dignity and purpose for everyone. But he did send the Savior, and this Ephadam is the man through the woman which would come the Savior himself. So returning then to, um, to this second chapter, let's pick it up if we may, with uh, verse 10, and let's go with it. Well, let me, let me say something first. He, the Lord out of the ground caused to grow every tree that is pleasant to sight and good for food, the tree of life also. I want to say that the word, in the next lecture, we're going to, I'm going to teach you in the Hebrew also the word tree. It's ets, E-T-S. And, and that's fruit trees. You're able to, you can eat apples all day long, if you like them. Peaches, oranges, anything, that is a tree that is, but what is this tree of life? Well, we learn right away the tree of life is the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. That is the tree that gives us life. But th what is then this tree of the knowledge of good and evil? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is none other than Satan himself. This, these are the limbs, and this is the trunk of the tree of life, the body. <clears throat> and the central nervous system runs up and down the backbone, which is the knowledge of good and evil. And Satan had both. He knew how to be good because he elevated himself by, by uh, earning it the position of the cherub that covereth, as we learned in Ezekiel 28. But at the same time, he had that evil streak that uh, caused him through his senses uh, to take pride in himself rather than Almighty God and want not to guard the mercy seat, to, but to sit on it. So therefore, there you have, if you would, the trees um, of that garden and what they consisted of. Created one set of people, formed the next. Got it? Don't confuse it. And continuing with verse 10. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. 
And from thence it was parted and became into four heads, four streams. Eleven, the name of the first is Python. That is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. You, you can find it there. Twelve, and the gold of that land is good. And then is Bedrium, Bedrium, and the onyx stone, a plenty. Thirteen, and the name of the second river is Gihon, or Gihon. The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And so it is. This is the reason many people feel with the next one that the Euphrates, the Tigris, and all form up these uh, particular rivers. 14, I would not want to debate that issue. And the name of the third river is Hedekal. And that is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And there you have it, and thus being the explanation. And uh, how, how precious it is. Verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Again, I want to warn you not to hunt, not to fish. God's plan is perfect, and he has a plan for all people. There is a destiny for all people. This man is to dress that garden and to prepare it and uh, to tend the garden, to dress it. That means cultivate it, uh, prune it, and keep it. Verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man. Give me a guess what you think in the Hebrew manuscripts the man is. It's eth ha'adon. The man through which Christ would come, in biblical cord to biblical cord, through the woman, saying, "Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat uh, freely eat." In other words, uh, the Hebrew word "et" you can go in there, you can partake of the fruit. All it's, that's what I created them for: is to sustain you in, in the Garden of Eden, to trim those trees, to take care of them, prune them, and they will provide for you. They will yield year after year after year. But that other tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Satan, stay away from it. And, um, uh, so, and so it is. Do you understand this is the first law that God will, will pronounce upon? It is uh, that very thing. The next verse, 17. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil... Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, well, how could that be? What, to, what does that mean? Well, if you partake of Satan, you're going to die. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's the first commandment in the Word of God, is to leave the devil alone. You might say, well, what, what does he mean? Some people live 900 years old before they die. Well, how long do you think a day is with the Lord? A day with the Lord is a thousand of man's years. What he's saying, you mess around with that tree of the uh, good, uh, knowledge of good and evil, and you're going to die. You're not going to make it past that, uh, the end of the Lord's day. And that's rather um, synonymous, if you would, with the fact that if you don't uh, stay away from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, even after the Lord's day called the millennium, you're not going to make it. So we see the founding father as he uh, instills and brings forth this history, the beginning, Genesis. He tells us exactly how it is, but very little is different today than it was then as far as overcoming and obeying the commandments of God, leave the tree of the knowledge of good and evil alone. Don't even argue with Satan. Just get behind me in the name of Jesus Christ, period. You don't even talk to him. Uh, and uh, he's a sleuth and, um, and tricky. God said, leave him alone. And, and so it is. That's the first commandment. 
you break that one and you're always going to end up in trouble. Uh, let me put it a, a little plainer. Anytime you mess around with the devil and his ways, you're going to end up in trouble. It will bring you nothing but grief and misery. Why go there? The devil has many trades and tricks that he uses on people. And uh, in that releases hurt. Uh, God knew what he was talking about. You're going to die in the day you eat thereof. You mess with him, you're going to hell. That's what it means. Okay, then verse 18 to continue. And the Lord said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. In other words, I'm going to, he'd already, well, he'd already back in the sixth day created female. Here we rest, he rested the seventh, and now we're in the eighth day. And Adam, eth ha Adam, not Adam, but eth ha Adam doesn't have a helpmate. Why wouldn't God give him one of those other females? Well, because eth ha Adam is through who the son would come. So he's different. Verse 19. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them into, unto Eth Ha'adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Eth Ha'adam called every living creature that was the name thereof. Well, now wait a minute. God created things to hunt back in the sixth day and now here we are rested the seventh, and now we got the eighth day. And, and he's bringing the, well, what did he say he was going to create? Help me. A farmer must have livestock to perform the work of the farm. Domestic animals had to be created whereby Adam could name them horses. There sure weren't any mules because that's a hybrid, but there were donkeys and, and uh, horses, uh, cattle, and things that you would utilize, domestic animals, that uh, he would provide upon the farm to tend it, to take care of it, to cultivate it. And he named them, and it was good. Now, you know, it is the Word of God flows if you simply listen to the Word of God instead of Sunday school stories of trees and snakes and, and this sort of thing which doesn't have anything to do with the Word of God. So you want to listen to this Word. As God brings it forth and as He explains it, then you can have a much better understanding of life itself, why we have hunters and fishers and why we have farmers. Verse 20, And Adam, and Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an helpmate for him. There, there was no female, there was no wife. How could he produce and bring forth the Son of God if he did not have a wife that was suitable for that occasion? And naturally, she will very definitely be, because Eve is the mother of all living for only one reason. Not that her womb produced all races, but that her womb, umbilical cord to umbilical cord, would produce the Son of God, and you're in Him, or you're not living. So she is the mother of all living, because she was the mother to be of, uh, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the Savior of this world, when you accept Him. How precious it is. 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. Now, this is one of uh, false teaching. It misleads people and has from the beginning of time. Do you know what this word rib is in the Hebrew? It's curve. He took the curve from Adam. That's why women have better curves than men. And, and I jest. Now, I shouldn't do that. But have you ever heard, let's go deep now, have you ever heard of the helix curve? The helix curve is a term concerning DNA. 
we didn't know about DNA uh, too awful many years ago. But today we know about the helix curve, and we know that God took the feminine DNA from Adam and created w woman. It wasn't one of, uh, one of his ribs. It was part of the helix curve, the DNA, and produced woman. That is to say, this helpmate. And actually, it is the womb through which, in biblical cord to in biblical cord, Christ will come. And I know that's quite a shock to a lot of people. Well, I just had to know that man's got one less rib than anybody. Man's got all of his ribs. But he doesn't have all of his curves. The helix curve, it's gone. Okay? Or it should be, or you'd be in bad shape, or quite, you'd be a little bit on the feminine side, wouldn't you? So, next verse, please. Verse 22, and the rib, the curve, now, I'm even going to add the helix curve, which the Lord God had taken from Adam, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Happy days are here again. I mean, he had him a helpmate, and, and there would be family, and how precious it is. That's, that's what makes the world go around. But the most beautiful thing to man is here we have the mother and father, which umbilical cord to umbilical cord, one man's history, one man's life, one man's destiny. Through him would come, and her would come, the Lord Jesus Christ, umbilical cord to umbilical cord. And that's why that God always protected that genealogy all down through history, whereby that virgin would conceive, rightfully so, directly from this eth ha -adam. Now, there will be a time when we get to the sixth chapter, you're going to find that Satan will attack again, and in the fourth he will attack. He didn't win, but he can sure cause a lot of trouble. Verse 23, what, what is this, this supposed to accomplish? And Adam, eth ha -adam, said, This is now bone of my bones, curve of my curve, and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, man, because she was taken out of man. The DNA was taken, she was formed, and here we go. Verse 24, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now, you, you got to understand that. When a man and a woman marry, they become one flesh, especially, well, how, how can that be? Well, when the two father and mother a child, it is of both their DNA, both their curve, and the, the helix curve from both parents. And so it is that... Um, the two become one. A lot of, seems like people forget, though, that when you become one flesh, you leave the mother and father as far as family forming. That does not mean you do not honor your mother and father. But that union comes first, fine, because you're one. You're one flesh. And what does not offend the other half of that flesh is fine. And whatever doesn't offend that half of the flesh, that's fine. You're one. And that one body originates or, or operates within itself, a complete unit. And that is good. That is as it should be. Okay. Verse 25, to complete this chapter. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Why? They, they were innocent. They had not partaken of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil at this time. They didn't, they had no part of that sin. We'll be getting to that, though. But uh, this is how innocent it is when you go with the Father's Word and take men's traditions or man's traditions and throw them out the window. Get rid of them. Go by the Word of God, the manuscripts. Use them. 
grow by them and know and understand God's plan for his children. Why? He loves his children. He loves his people. This is why he would tell um, uh, Peter, don't you dare call the other races a para, a, 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 a bala in the Greek tongue. Don't you call them common. They're my children. And so it is. Are they different? Of course they're different. Your eye can tell by looking. But with dignity, they are all children of God, and there's nothing racist about it. And, and so it is. You know, many people will, um, the, the scholars of the Hebrew manuscripts know there were more people than Adam and Eve. So they bring forth mythology, the Lilith, uh, to cover up for the fact that other people, do you know why they do not want to teach the difference between Adam, mankind, and Eth Ha'adam, the farmer? Because they're afraid people call him a racist. And it, the, the truth is the truth, and in innocence, dignity for all of God's children, for it's all one family. But there is that difference, kind after kind, and that's the way God likes it. That's the way he created us. And as you read the last verse of chapter 1, God looked after the creation of all the nations, and it was good. There, is, there are some points in history that bear checking out. Many might say, well, then they were created a thousand years before um, Eth Ha'adam. Well, that's very possible. This is why that Chinese history goes back much further than our history. There's a reason for it, and it's real simple to understand. So always accept God's Word as it is written, looking at the facts and taking those facts, but most of all, let God teach, and you listen. All right, bless your hearts. Don't miss the next lecture. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are. Back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, share it. Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We don't judge people. We have one judge. He gets it done. But you do have spiritual discernment. It leads you, guides you, and directs you. It's a gift from God to let you know truth when you hear it. Hang on to it. It's precious, the Word of God. Don't ever let anyone take that away from you. Satan would like nothing better than have you listen to um, ratchet jaws that uh, are not familiar with the manuscripts. You stick with the Word of God. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Again, always a pleasure. Those of you that um, have a prayer request, hey, you know what? You don't need that number, and you don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. He does. He knows what you need. But do you know what he needs? He has needs also. He needs you to let him know you love him. That's the main thing he wants from mankind is their love. He created us for his good pleasure. And 
what pleasures him is for you to let him know you love him. Father, we love you. And uh, don't forget to, to tell him that daily even if you, if you can in your prayers and, and be blessed. That's what brings God's blessings down. Let's go to his throne. Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, Father, direct, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me, Drusilla from Colorado. Pastor Murray, in regards to the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation. Does God lead a, uh, or tempt us? No, but he allows you to be tempted but if you've ever read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, he will never allow you to be tempted over what you can handle. And he will always show you a way out. If you love him, that's, that makes all the difference. You, you cannot ignore the creator of all things. You cannot ignore the father of your very soul. And then whine and complain, poor me baby, that he doesn't help you. Why should he? You, you are nothing to him as far as that's concerned if he has to go by what your communication gives. Therefore, let your communication be, I love you, Father. Help me. And receive the help because he will send it. <clears throat> Caroline from Pennsylvania, my husband passed away and I want to marry a man who has been divorced. Would this be a sin for me? Well, you, you have to know a little bit more. If, if I were to go by the law, I would have to know what the reason was for his divorce. There are legitimate biblical reasons for divorce. But at the same time, I as a teacher know that divorce is not the unpardonable sin. Therefore, if one is divorced and realizes they're part of the mistake and repents from the heart and change of mind, they're clean. So then you could marry and go in peace. Okay? Uh, divorce and adultery are not the unpardonable sin. They're forgivable. Brad from Missouri. I run a sawmill and we have a saying, good old winner. I was wondering if in the millennium we will be able to look back and laugh at the good times we had working through the winter months. Well, yours truly had, um, on back in my farming days, I had a big sawmill on my place as well. Uh, and it was, a, it was a joy to, to um, take timber and shape it and form it into lumber, cross ties, what have you, good old times, you betcha. Uh, Ke Kenneth from Texas, are we predestined to die at a certain time? No, we are not. Probably your best scripture on that would be Luke chapter 13, where the, those 18 souls that died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were bigger sinners than anyone else? No, no they were just in the wrong place at the right time to die. But it was not their destiny it just, stuff happens. That's what God wants you to know from that. And, and you can put yourself into bondage uh, to that if you're not real careful, okay? But um, this is why that um, wisdom is a precious thing, to know where to go, where not to go, how to take care of yourself, and how not to take care of yourself. And still, accidents happen. Uh, okay, we got um, Barbara from Missouri. What does Amos chapter 5, verses 18 through 21 mean? Thank you. Uh, those verses can be very confusing because God is saying, the Lord's day is not going to be a good time for you. And he continues on. He said, your sacrifices, I, I'm, I'm going to get rid of them. Don't want them. What does it mean? Then why, why wouldn't the Lord's day be a good day for somebody? Because they're going to hell. They're sinners. They don't love the Lord. So when, they come, when the Lord's day comes where we'll be rejoicing because we've overcome, they're going to wake up just like the rich man did in the parable of rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16, and it's too late, Charlie. You're on the wrong side of the gulf, and that's where you will stay unless there's a big change through the millennium. So 
It, it just simply means the, the Lord's day is not going to be a happy time for the wicked. Okay. Uh, Peter from North Carolina. Pastor Murray, thank you so much. If, say, is, if Satan is released in the season of the locust, does that mean this mean for certain that it will be May through September or sometime between May and September? Well, you know, you want to be real careful. That's, it does mean that period of time. But at the same time, he says he comes as a thief in the night, and if you'd been watching, you'd know, and he tells you to be a watchman. So uh, pray that your plight be not in the winter. We're put on guard as watchmen regardless of what time of the year it is. Watch the events and be aware and alert as to what is going on. We're living in times where almost daily you can see current events aligning with our Father's prophecies. And uh, you want to pay attention. Uh, Carter from Georgia, when a person's spirit goes to heaven after they die, is this spirit alive and active or is it asleep and resting until judgment day? It's alive and very active. This is why that this is why Jesus taught that uh, 16th chapter of Luke concerning rich man and Lazarus. What was Lazarus doing? He was rejoicing, greeting Abraham and all the other um, wonderful people of Almighty God. Why they were all alive, very vivacious, active, and serving God. And as far as that's concerned, what was the wicked, evil guy, hell-bound, what was he doing? He was very much awake to his chagrin as he looked at what he had accomplished in his life on earth and realized he was going to hell if something didn't change. And then he even softened up and said, at least send a, a, a Lazarus back and warn my brothers so they don't end up in this place. They're very much alive. God is not the God of the dead, but the living. Apollo from Illinois, will you explain how the Christians will be persecuted on two levels in the end times? I, I, think, I, I think what you mean, you've probably heard me say there are two uh, tribulations. But neither one of them persecute Christians. The first one tries because it's the tribulation of Satan. And he will cause some Christians to be delivered up for trial. Why? It's a church. And he, Satan has, the, he will have the biggest revival this earth has ever seen. And he's trying to convert you to his, to worship him. Just like he tried to get Christ to worship him in the wilderness in the time of temptation. Don't be tempted by Satan. But the second is God's tribulation, and he loves you. He's not angry at you. He's going to take care of you, so you've got nothing to worry about. It is the, those that don't make it that will begin to have a heap of hurt because they're on their way to hell if they're not careful. We've still got the millennium before the great white throne takes place. Uh, Jackie from Kentucky. In the millennium, the elect serving God, is that men and women or just men? What does it say in, what does it say in Acts chapter 2 when God's elect begin to speak in that Pentecostal tongue, which is not unknown. It's, known, it's every language of the world all at one time. Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit speaking. But what, what does it say? It says, both men and women, my, uh, women will prophesy. And where does that come from? The book of Joel, chapter 2. Both my sons and daughters. God uses all of his children. Okay. Women have always had a great place in God's word. Okay, Hulda, as you know from the Old Testament, she was in charge of the, the um, Bible college. I'll put it that way. And when the leaders got confused, they went to Hulda to have her squared away for them to make the proper decision from Almighty God. God uses whomever he chooses. Uh, Melody from Oklahoma. 
during the 1,000 year reign of Christ, will we be in spiritual bodies? Also, will 1,000 years be 1,000 years in our time now? Yes. That's, that is that one day with the Lord, and the Lord's day is only one day long for him, 1,000 years of our time. Um, we are at, the, at that seventh trump, we instantly change into spiritual bodies, which are exactly like the bodies we're now in, only there's no age, so they're young, adult, healthy, and, um, and therefore living etern excuse me, for the eternity, if they so uh, overcome. If they don't overcome, they're in a heap of hurt. They don't make it. Okay, uh, Leonard from, where is Leonard from? He's from California. What does the Bible say about church uh, giving after you're laid off? In my area alone, there are what I call superdome churches where pastors drives a Bentley and has a home three times the size of mine. Is this what is preached in the Bible? No, it, no, it isn't. And, um, what does the Bible say about giving when you're laid off? You tithe, and what is 10% of nothing? 10% of nothing is nothing. So you don't owe any tithe. And um, I, uh, I, I am sorry, God doesn't send out beggars. And when these people beg with their Superdome churches, then they're in a heap of hurt too, okay? And so it sets a bad reputation for Christianity. God said, when you go out teaching God's word, do not take a begging bag with you. If you're really teaching God's word, you don't have to beg. You'll be supported. Jim from New Jersey. Why do they talk about the crucifixion being a cross when the Bible says Jesus was hung on a stake? Well, uh, who, who crucified Christ? It certainly wasn't the chief priest, because they did not have the authority to execute a person. This is why they had to go to all the Roman courts to get Pilate to pass the death sentence, um, because they didn't have the authority. Therefore, answer, the Romans crucified Christ. It had to be. Well, how do the Romans crucify people? On a Roman cross. And so it is. End of story. Dorothy from Illinois. Where in the Bible does it tell us what we should uh, and should not eat? Well, uh, many places in the Bible. Um, Leviticus chapter 11 gives you the difference in eating scavengers and clean food. Christ would tell you in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, don't ever let somebody judge you in marriage. In other words, well, they judged me because I was divorced once. Well, did you repent and were you forgiven? Then don't let them judge you. Christ forgave you. Who cares what they think? Okay. But then he follows that by saying, or in food for that that I created to be received. Now, a lot of people think that that means God opened up clean food for everything. That's not what it says. He said, don't let anybody judge you in eating what I created to be received. He did not create scavengers to be received. But they're still good. You know why? Because they were created to cleanse the earth, and the scavengers were, of, um, of, of disease and other things. Therefore, you don't want to eat them because they are diseased. Michael from Arkansas. I was listening to the Mark of the Beast CD. And I wondered if the seven heads could be the seven churches. No, no. Uh, the the seven-headed beast is a political beast. Therefore, it cannot be religious. The religious beast, and I'm going from Revelation 13, the religious beast doesn't show up until chapter, the ver rather, verse 11. I'll say that again. The multi-headed beast appears in the first part of um, the 13th chapter, which is political. Because any time that God gives a multi-headed thing, it is political. It's a government. And it's going to receive a deadly wound. It's the one world political system. But then in the 11th verse, then one entity shows up 
claiming to be Christ. I mean, he looks like the lamb slaying. But he's got the voice of the dragon. Why? Because it's Satan in disguise. And you don't want to go there, and you don't want to be deceived. Uh, Wanda from Indiana. Are the fallen angels on earth with us today? No, they're not. They are locked away in chains to be released when Satan is released. Now, this is what seems to be hard for people to grasp. Satan also is locked in heaven, but his evil spirit and evil spirits, even of the fallen ones, can come to earth. In other words, God's Holy Spirit is here, though Christ is on the right hand of God, on the throne of God. But the Holy Spirit, His Spirit is here, well, so is Satan's. God always, for every negative, there's a positive. And you have those evil spirits to deal with. No step for a stepper. Why? Because God gives us power over them. And, but as far as the fallen angels, don't, don't worry. When they come, they're supernatural. They can perform miracles that people will wow over. They'll, they will, if you're not prepared for it, you, they will deceive you. But knowing God's word and having God's seal in your forehead, you're not going to be deceived. You don't find them tempting. Grace from Georgia, are the 7,000 people who are going to be teachers in the millennium on earth to now? Yes, they are. They are the last, the first or last, and the last shall be first. Uh, God's elect were chosen in, before the foundations of this earth. They stood against Satan then, and God can trust them to stand against Satan when he's cast out very soon. He knows he can trust them. And so they're, they're the generation of the fig tree. They're living now. Uh, Dan from Mississippi, what is the definition of um, rapture and resurrection? Thank you. That's a good question. The, the uh, definition of rapture is to be fuzzy-headed, okay? It's a, called the rapture of the deep. You get all air bubbles in your system, and you can't think straight, and you want to fly and fly and fly, and you're, you're crazy, okay? That's what the rapture, uh, the definition of rapture, check it out in your Strong's Dictionary. I'm sorry, your Webster's Dictionary. And the old rapture of the deep is a deadly thing. But it's more deadly to the soul and your spirit body than it is your flesh body. You want to be very careful. The definition of resurrection is euthanasia, which is to say, to be resurrected has three meanings. Number one, it means to stand up for Christ. Well, that raises you to a higher level of thinking. The second reason is to not only stand up for Christ, to, be, to believe on Christ. That's kind of the first. That raises you to a higher level of thinking. And the third definition of resurrection is to absolutely overcome at death into uh, your immortal body. You don't, a uh, soul rather. You don't have to go through um, the millennium with a spiritual body, but a mortal soul. You're resurrected to, into an immortal soul, meaning deathlessness. You're not going to die. You have eternal life, and you have earned it. Audrey from Mississippi, I heard you mention that at the end of the millennium, all the bodies of water will be covered over. What will happen to all the ocean life? Thank you. It goes along with the firmament where it goes back in the place it was to protect this earth from any storm or anything that would offend, and, and uh, God's plan is just perfect, and that's, that's the way it is. That's where it was to begin with, and that's where it goes back to. Charles from North Carolina, where in the Bible is it documented that Jesus went to hell and preached to the prisoners? Well, you, you can read it for yourself. It's 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. He went back all the way to the time of Noah, which means the beginning. That's an analogy, meaning a figure of speech, meaning all the way to the beginning. Why? Why would God do that? Well, how, what kind of God would we have 
If before Christ paid the price on the cross, there was no salvation, you had to do it by the law. And that was a pretty tough old road to follow because everybody breaks those laws sooner or later and repents. And, but here, all we, even after sinning and repentance, he saves us. Well, that's a little unfair, isn't it, to somebody back then. So God loves all of his children. So he sent Christ back to everyone in paradise, and he preached to them. And all those that accepted salvation overcame. You can read that in the fourth chapter of uh, 1 Peter. Many of the prisoners were freed. Okay, Beatrice from uh, California Will God forgive you for getting divorced and remarried? Remarriage and divorce are not the unpardonable sin. Unpardonable is the only unpardonable sin there is. So divorce and... I know a lot of ministers get upset with me because they read, well, God said right there that if you have a living wife uh, and uh, that you commit adultery if you do this, that, or the other. Well, there are, first off, legally speaking, there are reasons for divorce legally, but at the same time, there's repentance and forgiveness where you start over and have a clean life. That's what Christianity is about. Don't ever let anyone rob you of it. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. That's the only way to do it, to let God do the talking and teaching. That way you can really grow and have a foundation. You make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Now, most important, though, listen to me and you listen good. You stay in his word every day, in his word, even with trouble. Still a good day. You know why? Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. Epistles of John, three letters written by the Apostle John, that disciple whom Jesus loved. The tenderness of John's writings is marked by the number of times he begins the exhortations and warnings with, my little children, or little children. In fact, little children is written seven times in the first epistle alone. The contents of the first epistle are practical teaching in the light of the love of God. God is life, is light, is truth, is righteous, is love and we have fellowship with him through the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. The tenderness and love of John's writing continues in the second epistle as he encourages the elect lady and her children to love one another. He also writes, this is love, that we walk after his commandments, after these words of encouragement. John warns us that there are many deceivers entered into the world and explains how to identify these deceivers. Don't miss this opportunity to study the epistles of John with Pastor Arnold Murray.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour, our Heavenly Father's Word. Hey, today we're going to start a new subject. It's titled Strange Fire. And there's one thing, you know, in our Father's Word, there's always a negative, forever positive. There, as we just finished two tribulations, a good one, and a, they're both good, but one is negative and the other positive. By that I mean negative in the sense that Satan heads one and Christ the other. 